you couldn't stand on your feet without holding on to something. You had to, you had to hold on to a table or 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 the ceiling. So you're sort of just moving around with the ship. And I was thinking, this is nuts. What am I doing out here? I should never have left home. Stupid project. This was a mistake. Welcome back to When It Hits the Fan, the podcast that delves into what really happens when things go wrong on the road. Brought to you by Battleface, the tough face of travel insurance. Now, visiting every country on earth is a travel challenge that many dream about, but few ever achieve. Of course, the sheer logistics, not to mention the cost, are pretty high hurdles to overcome, even with the convenience that modern air travel brings. But today's guest wasn't satisfied with merely visiting every country. He wanted to make it into a real challenge by doing it without flying. In fact, to Bjorn C. Peterson, better known to his fans as Thor, decided he would see the world without planes, without renting, buying or borrowing any vehicles, and instead relying on public transportation and hitching rides on container ships. Thor, originally from Denmark, was well on track to complete this incredible challenge, having visited 194 of the 203 countries on his list when coronavirus struck, bringing international travel to a standstill and stranding him for more than 500 days in Hong Kong. And that's where we find him today, still planning his onward journey to visit the final few destinations on his list. Thor's very active online, uh, including putting out regular blog posts about his continuing adventures. So if you'd like to learn more about him and his travel challenge, we'll put some links in the description of the video below. And of course, we'd love if you could give this interview a thumbs up or a like on whichever platform you're using. And of course, hit the subscribe button if you'd like to be notified about the next episode. But that's enough from me. Let's hear from Thor himself. Great to uh, finally have you on the podcast. How are you? I'm all right. Uh, everything considered, I'm, I'm doing good. How are you? I'm very well. Thank you. And um, I suppose we should probably point out that, that you, you know, we're, we're recording this right at the end of uh, May, May uh, last day of May, in fact, and you are yeah. currently still stuck in Hong Kong. Is that the situation? Yeah. Closing in on 500 days of being here during the pandemic. So that's great. Wow, and I mean, this was certainly not the plan that you uh, you set out with to to uh, to spend this no. in well over a year in in Hong Kong, and I'm sure people can probably guess that the reason for this was obviously the coronavirus outbreak and and travel restrictions. Is there any movement on that? How are things over there? Do, do you know when you might be able to, um, you know, continue on your journey? Oh, it's such a headache. Um, I, I I sort of feel like I have a couple of openings that. Uh, Maybe I'll be able to reach out to either New Zealand or Australia and explain my situation and say that I have an online following and that I will be able to promote them. And then maybe they will grant me access, but I still need to get on a ship and maybe I can work something out and I still need to deal with immigration over then maybe I can work. So there's that. And then there's also, um, there's a nice Dutch guy in Palau and uh, Palau is a country in the Pacific, small island nation with only 20,000 people. And uh, this Dutch guy uh, befriended the president of Palau and told him about my project and who I am. And the president thinks it sounds great and, and would love to invite me in. So I might be able to get a presidential letter. But then again, uh, that means I can get inside Palau. Then I need the ship and I need to uh, straighten things out with immigration. And then if I went to Palau, and I'm sure Palau is lovely and beautiful, but what's the next step? And, and what if I got stuck for another 500 days in Palau versus staying in Hong Kong a bit later? And there's just a lot of uncertainty. I spoke with um, a top dog within shipping here in Hong Kong yesterday, and he said, uh, settle in in Hong Kong, this is going to be a while. So I don't know, I don't know. I guess that this is just the kind of, the, the situation everyone finds themselves in at the moment with coronavirus. and. You know, we we just have to exercise a certain amount of patience, I suppose, even if you're, you know, on a on a challenge such as yours. Yeah, well, that's that's true. And and I look around and I see that there are a lot of people that have had it way more rough than what I have, and uh, I can certainly appreciate that that's the situation. Um, I'm I'm thinking about myself, and and I would like to move on, but but in 
in the big perspective, I ended up being stuck in Hong Kong and, and it could have been a lot worse than that. Uh, Hong Kong has nature and great people and amazing culture, good food and a lot of opportunity. I could have been stuck at sea or a tiny place in the Pacific. So overall, things, things are good, although I feel very thinly worn <laughs> by now. Of course. Yeah. And obviously, you know, I, I explained at the start, really, the um, the constraints that you'd set yourself on this challenge, you know, not only to, to visit every country on Earth, but to do so without flying as well as, you know, without, you know, uh, renting or, 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 or buying a or any type of vehicle. Um, and, and your your tale of, you know, when it all went wrong or uh actually happened at sea didn't it do you want to kind of give us some context and, and tell us you know which part of the or sorry whereabouts in the journey this took place and, and where you were traveling from uh to oh you mean in relation to the storm that's right yeah yeah so i was very green uh, this was early on within this project we had just crossed into 2014 uh, it was early days. I had reached roughly 40 countries uh, by the time. And I got on board a container ship heading out from Reykjavik in Iceland. And we were destined to go across the North Atlantic in the winter time. And that's a notorious sea. Uh, and uh, especially the winter time, they can have some really, really rough seas. And everything was fine. And I remember uh, we, we set out from the port in the evening and beautiful, stunning sunset. And the captain looked at me, I was up on the bridge and he said, this, this looks good. Uh, this could be a good omen for our voyage across the North Atlantic. And, and we, it was a ship that was about 10 years old, which is no age for a container ship. Well, it was quite worn, uh, this ship. It was an ice class, and we received uh, some reports that the, there had been some ice sightings um, from uh, icebergs that had broken off in, in Greenland and in the North Atlantic that were drifting. So we were on watch for that, and we headed into, headed into the ocean. And then uh, it was good for a couple of days, I think. And uh, then suddenly we uh, received warnings that uh, the weather was going to get rough. And uh, they told me about that. I thought, okay. And we got into that weather and it was extraordinarily rough uh, for someone as green as, as I was. The ship was all over the place. It was bouncing uh, one side to the other. It was rolling. It was pitching. It was absolutely nuts. Uh, thunder and lightning. The waves were crashing in over the containers. I mean, I've only seen this kind of stuff in on the Discovery Channel or in movies and so on. Well, and to, go, I was, to go back for a second, then I mean, um, yeah. you said that this journey was from from Reykjavik, and and it was and it was heading to where? What, what was the? Oh, uh, we were on our way to Canada. To, on, on your way to, to, Canada. to Canada, and yeah, how long? Halifax. Okay, how how long would that journey normally have taken on a uh, container ship? It was supposed to be eight days. It was nominated for for eight days, and um, and it, it, under normal circumstances, it, it surely would have been. But then we we hit this weather and. I, I was bouncing around all over the place. I walk up on the bridge and uh, I'd been on a few ships and, and normally up on the bridge, you'll have uh, whichever officer is in charge. And then maybe you'll have a watchman. So like one, one or two people up on the bridge. We're talking six or seven people up on the bridge, talking, debating. And everyone was rather calm. Like uh, they were definitely professionals. They've done this before. They've probably seen much worse, but but I was not calm. I was on the exterior, maybe so, but inside I was a riot. And uh, I was sure we were going to go down. I was sure this would be the end of things. And you have the, um, the, the, the wipers <laughs> on these big glass windows they have and the, the crazy ocean outside and the sound of the storm. And the, you couldn't stand on your feet without holding on to something. You had to, you had to hold on to a table or, or, or the ceiling, so you sort of just moving around with the ship, and I was thinking, this is nuts, what am I doing out here? I should never have left home, stupid project, this was a mistake. And, uh, and then at, at some point, I see my chance uh, to, to ask one of the officers, so, is, is this normal? And two of the officers turn around and they just kind of look at me, and then they start laughing, say, relax, son. This is absolutely nothing. You'll be fine. We'll get through this. Don't worry about it. Just make sure you don't fall off the ship. You'll be okay. 
So with their confidence, I felt confident. And, uh, and my days sort of just continued. I, I left the bridge. I remember going to get something to eat. And that's further down uh, below on the ship. So there's less movement when you're further down below than when you're up on the bridge. And it was still moving about like crazy. Chairs were falling on their side. And at some point, you should try to take a chair and try to push it over with one finger and see how much it takes for a chair before it falls on its side. This ship was truly moving a lot. And I use that as a reference because we tend to exaggerate as time goes on and time passes by, we exaggerate the fish was this big and so on. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes I look back at that and I think, was it really that bad? And I try to look at some of my photos and some of my video and it doesn't look that crazy. But then I remember I wasn't taking photos and I wasn't filming when it was really, really crazy because I was just holding on. And, and that chair incident, that really puts it back in my mind, like that ship was surely moving. So you go up and you get something to eat and, and there's buffet style and you get it on your plate and you're wobbling around on your feet and you get something on the plate and you sit down in a chair and you hold on to the table with one hand, you hold on to the plate with your other hand. And if you do not hold on to the table, then you'll fall on your side with the chair. And if you're not holding on to the plate, then the plate will fly into the wall. And then you quickly realize that you're not left with any hands. You're, both your hands are occupied. <laughs> so you, you try to eat really quickly and hold on yeah. to the table. Again. I, I went back up into my cabin and uh, the, there, was, um, there was a closet and the door had, the lock had broken and the door had opened. And then some of the drawers inside just flew out against the, against the wall just across the road. I'm like, what is going on here? And it was really hard to sleep because you would constantly wake up on the floor or while being awake, just roll out of the bed and land on the floor. Um, taking a shower was crazy. You turn on the water and wait for it to come and it goes one side and the water <laughs> goes the other side. <laughs> come on. And then going to the toilet was a great adventure as well. I don't think I need to specify. So, no, yeah. Um, yeah, so this, this went on for four days. Wow. And then and four days is a really, really long time in such conditions. And then it settled. And I was so tired. I, I fell asleep and slept like a baby. Uh, but, but, but it settled. And then as it settled, uh, the ocean turned to, <coughs> sorry, it turned to mirror-like conditions. I, I've seen lakes like that, but I didn't know that the ocean could do this. I thought there would always be a little bit of movement or some ripples. It was just a mirror. And it was a deep blue mirror. It looked uh, nothing I've ever seen either before or after. And then eventually you would see a little bit of movement in the surface of the water. And then you'd notice that that was life. There were whales and there were dolphins all over the place. And uh, when night nighttime came and the stars came out above, it was clear, dark black uh, sky with, with stars and northern lights because we were so far up north. So you're in this container ship moving through this mirror and you see the, the stars in the ocean and up above you moving across and the northern lights. So uh, roughly four or six hours before uh, we could see, before we had a visual on uh, the Canadian um, coastline, just we still had ocean all the way around, even with binoculars, you couldn't see land anywhere. There was this strong sense of being within the forest. So you can imagine being in a huge forest surrounded by trees. And this was the smell that hit our, our, our senses. And you look around and there's no timber. There's, there, there are no trees. But you just had this thick smell of, of forest and trees. And what had happened was that as we were heading towards Canada, the, the coast and, and the, much of the inland was covered in trees and forest. And the wind was heading out towards sea, so pollen was being blown out. But wow. four to six hours before you could see land, yeah, this hit us. And we had been at sea for 12 days in, in total, and uh, which is not a long time to be at sea uh, for, for seafarers. But, but, but 12 days, so you, there was nothing else than the, the scent of the ocean, which isn't much really. And um, the ship, uh, which, uh, and, and uh, salt and uh, maybe a little bit of oil and so on and suddenly forest in your face and then eventually we could see Canada and we came in and came into Nova Scotia first and then the next day we reached um, Halifax 
and and I had reached country number 41. But it, but it, it added, you know, four days onto the journey. I mean, that's how long this this storm lasted for. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So we had we had issues with the ship moving so far out of the ocean that the propeller came up out of the water. And that meant that we had to slow down in order to, uh, my memory's a little, but I, I think it's something to do with the frequency uh, within the waves and, and, uh, and so on. So we had to slow down to four knots per hour and uh, these ships, they go wow. much, much faster than sure. that uh, ordinarily. Yeah, so it slowed us down. And also I think as, as the most sensible thing is you try to navigate out of the eye of, of, these, of the storm, you try to go around it or wait. But yeah, so we were in that and, and that was a crazy experience. And really? you know that this was this wasn't far from where the Titanic went down. Oh really? So, I also, I also had, had the, so we knew these icebergs were out there, and uh, and I knew the Titanic went down around there. That that's a bit of trivia. You kind of don't want to know in that situation. Is that, <laughs> yes. yeah? I wish I didn't yeah. know the Titanic went down here. I mean, it's fascinating what you say in terms of um, you know the the post storm beauty in terms of how um, how, how clear and and mirror like the sea was. You know. And especially with the Northern Lights as well. I mean, I suppose often with these types of situations, especially when you're traveling, you kind of sometimes have to endure these kind of extreme or even unpleasant situations in order to get through to these incredible situations that will, that will um, you know, kind of last with you for, for, for a lifetime. But you almost have to earn them. And it sounds like, you know, four days of this, you know, kind of absolutely terrifying storm and, and being stuck in the middle of it at sea you know, you really sort of earned that, you know, yeah. seeing, the, seeing the, the crystal clear sea and, and the northern lights. I, I certainly felt that I did. Well, I mean, it was an amazing crew and there were some great moments. So these four days were really intense, but, but outside of that, the good guys, there are a lot of Filipinos on board and they bring karaoke on board. So there was karaoke and music and having a good time. The captain, his name was Andre, is from Ukraine. Really, really good guy. I had a vaccination while on board. Um, because I was getting vaccinated for something and uh, then I had to space it out. So I think maybe X amount of days between the two vaccines, the two jabs. And uh, it just happened to be that I would be on the ship. So the captain, he gave me one jab <laughs> while on the ship. And I'm trying to explain, like, if I, if I go into uh, anaphylactic shock, then the adrenaline and wake me up again. Are you sure this is okay? Yeah. But and I, and I, I, ha I have to ask then, I mean, somebody who's been in that situation for, you know, that, that, um, length of time four days how do you normally get on with seasickness is this uh, not part of your constitution or was this an issue um i do get seasick but i didn't get seasick on that voyage i build up a tolerance so if i go with a few ships within uh, a few months then it seems that i i do not get seasick or maybe i can under special conditions mm. but then if i go for for a year or two without sailing or getting on a boat then it seems that I, I can easily, especially on, on small boats, sailboats and so on, get seasick. You lose your sea legs very quickly, I guess. Yeah, very quickly. But I gained them quite quickly as well. So, yeah. But uh, yeah, no, 12 days on board that ship, no problem. Uh, just scared uh, until I, I gained the confidence of the crew. <laughs> um, Thor, I, I know you're a, a very active um, blogger. You know, if people want to find out more about you, about your continuing journey, which, of course, you know, you're 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 very close to finishing, but uh, you haven't finished yet. Well, where, where should they do that? Where, where's the best place to find you online? Oh, people are welcome to come and find the project. The project is called Once Upon a Saga. It's available on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. There's a YouTube channel where you cannot expect too much from me. And then there's a blog uh, by searching onceuponasaga.dk, but uh, also .com will bring you there. Brilliant. So, I mean, we will put the um, we'll put links to your your blog site certainly in the description of the video below, so that if people want to um, uh, you know find out more about you, they can do that. Um, but you. yeah, until next time we speak, um, Thor, we're going to be watching your your uh, continuing journey closely because, uh, of course, we want to see you rack up those final few countries. And uh, yeah. but yeah, it, until then, it's been uh, fantastic talking with you. Oh, thank you so much. You guys are always so good to me. Really appreciate it. Cheers. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye-bye. Guys, that's about as much as we've got time for this episode. Uh, we're going to be back very soon with more fantastic guests and more tales of adventures. 
uh, from all four corners of the world. Uh, if you want to find out more about the podcast, more about Battle Faith, then follow the links in the description below. And of course, yeah, hit that subscribe button to find out when we uh, release the next episode. But until then, goodbye.